All right, I might um, get started as people, the last few trickle in. I have the pleasure of chairing this second session and we're starting to, to kind of step down in um, scales now. So the second panel is looking at adaptive reuse, um, particularly around building sites and complexes. So the contemporary urban development often engages in the regeneration of disused industrial fabrics. This session will ask architects, urban designers and researchers to present contemporary examples of adaptive reuse. Um, of industrial buildings, they will discuss how new infrastructure can benefit communities through the provision of spaces for sustainable enterprise, housing and public amenity. So first speaker will be Alex Monock smith who is the founding director of Urban Projects Bureau, a multidisciplinary design and research practice specialising in architecture, urbanism, spatial strategy and design, and is also the program director of spatial practices at Central St. Martins. Francesco Alberti is our second speaker, associate professor at urban planning um, at DITA at the University of Florence, focusing on the cultural coherence and operational continuity between research and education about the city and the territory. So coordinator of the research unit, super. Um, and what's that, sorry? Thank you, Sustainable Urban Project and Research and co-founder of um, a really great website called Urban Life, a really great um, initiative called Urban Life. Um, Diana Ibanez Lopez is the course leader of the innovative MA Cities program at Central St. Martins. Diana was previously senior curator for architecture and built environment projects at Create London and an associate of the Y Factory and BRDV's architecture think tank on future cities since 2015. And Justin Mallier, a practicing architect and PhD candidate at Monash University, involved with built projects of diverse scope and scale, theoretical works, research, teaching, and writing. Um, founder of Justin Mallier Architecture and internationally awarded and public, uh, published collaborative studio based in both Australia and Italy. So a really great lineup of different types of speakers and interests. I might ask Alex to just come on down so that we can keep to time. And um, we will go from there. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us to take part of this. Hopefully this is the beginning of, of a long and industrious um, collaboration. So I've called my um, presentation Productive Ecologies, which is a theme that we've been working on for the last maybe 10 to 15 years in academic and professional projects in Asia and South America and, and London and Europe. Um, we use the theme to, or the term to describe um, maybe more integrated and multi-scalar approaches to urban renewal and the adaptation of post-industrial um, sites um, to promote ecologies or provide ecologies of socio and economic activities that are mutually productive. Um, it's often about integrating smaller scale creative industries and innovation or knowledge-based um, uh, industries within the more dominant forms of uh, manufacturing or older kind of industries in, in the industrial sites. And it's a really interesting or quite, can be quite an exciting design challenge, particularly in terms of providing um, more hybrid um, architectural typologies and also the role of public spaces and public realm to create a new kind of urbanity. And I'm gonna focus on um, describing and explaining a project we've been involved in in Enfield in London, um, which is a large urban regeneration site. Unfortunately, it's way less sunny in London than in Prato or Melbourne. So look forward to, it. you're gonna see lots of gray skies and a bit more doom and gloom. So just to start with, I wanted to touch on some of the, I'm building upon some of the um, discussion in the previous session um, on the sort of policy context in, in London at least. So um, there's a lot of focus on industrial sites and the role of industry in cities, which is really quite positive, I think. Now, the GLA, um, for those of you who don't know, is the Greater London Authority. So in, in London, we have our own, um, uh, I don't know how many, but local authorities. And then there's the Greater London Authority with the Mayor for London. That's a sort of super authority. Um, and there's been, a, um, over the last maybe 10 years, there's been a lot of interest in and recognition of the role of manufacturing spaces and industrial zones within the urban fabric and the inner city, as well as the peripheries of London. And then the commissioning of design guidance on how those sites might be integrated or adapted or added to, to, to work a little bit harder and promote and how they could be used to, as residential neighborhoods, um, neighborhoods that have um, much broader ecosystems and aren't just a sort of a blot in the, in the city. 
Uh, but often this comes with a bit of contradiction, which I'll expand upon a little later, because we also have a housing crisis. Um, so we're often in situations of working with local boroughs where we're working on industrial um, sites, but also have to meet quite extensive and ambitious housing targets. And those don't often come together. And that's the design challenge that we're facing in Enfield at the moment. OK, so this is Meridian Waters. So the this is Meridian Waters, and so the, the territory that we've been working on since about 2017, I think, um, is within the red um, uh, brackets. It's an 82 hectare regeneration site um, of predominantly industrial and post-industrial land, going back to the um, 1800s with Victorian kind of um, manufacturing, um, to then quite live industrial and low-grade industrial fabric that's there at the moment. The ambitions of the regeneration are massive. So we're building, um, or rather Enfield is wanting to build 10,000 new homes and provide 6,000 new jobs and contribute 6 billion to the economy. And there's massive new road and rail infrastructure and all sorts of things um, being planned. Just to locate it, the big road at the north there is the North Circular, which is a massive inner ring road of, 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 of London. And um, this is a, a huge Ikea. So no one knows of Meridian Waters, but when you tell them, oh, it's by Ikea, then everyone goes, oh, I get it. It's also one of the most deprived areas of London and the local residential fabric is, is, is pretty low grade. And there's a very low um, skills and employment deficit and a very young um, school leavers age. So, that, so, so this, it's an area that requires a lot of intention. Um, oh, which cursor? And this is just to locate it within London. So it's on the sort of on a peripheral condition of, of London, but it's also the top of the Lee Valley. And the Lee Valley is, um, was an industrial corridor. It is now an ecological corridor um, that runs down to the Thames and the Olympic Park um, is within the sort of Southern area of the Lee Valley. It's also an innovation corridor. And the, the second diagram there starts to situate it within um, innovation districts within London, but also more at a more regional scale that stretches from um, the Thames and the Lee Valley all the way up to Cambridge. And so there's an awful lot of, well, there's a sort of long-term regional plans for um, universities and, and knowledge industries with manufacturing along this corridor. Um, these are some of the sort of beauty spots in our site. So that's the North Circular where we spent quite a lot of time filling our lungs full of um, carbon dioxide. Um, uh, but heavy infrastructure and crossing these boundaries is a really big condition and is quite typical of industrial areas in, in, in the UK. Um, there's a massive, some massive scale sheds. This is my colleague Eleanor trying not to get overwhelmed in 2017, thinking, oh, what are we going to do with these huge scale sites? Um, and then there's our, our friend IKEA, which actually, as a, another lecture, is quite an important and tricky player um, in terms of the politics and finances of, of the urban regeneration. OK, so here's the vision. <laughs> um, uh, or one of the visions. So just to give a bit of context to the, to the proposals, this is one of the latest master plans for the area by Kalanda Schoberg, which is a Danish architecture practice. Um, previous master plan visions were provided by Arabs, by Karakusevic, Carson Architects, et cetera, et cetera. And in about 2017 or tw uh, maybe 2016, it was um, Enfield put it out to tender and appointed the preferred developer to develop the site. Um, but unfortunately, that developer pulled out after a couple of months. And so then there was a, a bit of a hiatus as they started to approach the second preferred developer who then decided that they weren't going to take it on. Now, there's a number of reasons for this, maybe financial risk, uh, economic risk, um, possibly, I wouldn't hate to say, I would hesitate, to, wouldn't hesitate to say this, but the situation in the UK and London as we were going through Brexit and all sorts of other things that made it quite unattractive, potentially. So the council took, and this is where it gets maybe a bit more exciting, um, the council took the very brave and ambitious decision to develop it themselves. And so they would, over whatever time period, 20 to 30 years, start to buy up each of the sort of parcels of land or sites that were shown on that first diagram um, and develop them themselves and commission them themselves. Now, that's a really, really risky thing to do. And I think it's very, very brave for a local authority to do that. It's also potentially a game changer. It could be quite a paradigm shifter for uh, methods of urban renewal and urban regeneration in London. 
And um, if they get it right, um, with some help from professional consultants, then it gives them potentially a lot more control or a lot more opportunity for design to be upstream and to be embedded within the sort of the, 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 the planning thinking. So the first thing that, that we did was work on them, work, was get commissioned by Biom Field with um, a number of other practices to do a 20 or 30 year meanwhile strategy, which is really exciting. So the, the um, and meanwhile is a sort of a big deal in, in the UK and in London at the moment, but whenever we've been involved in it, it's usually at the scale of a public space or sort of a temporary intervention, not at such an extensive scale of, of, of urbanism. And I think we were involved in coming up with a brief for the Meanwhile project because it's a massive site. There are huge amounts of people living and working there and it's going to take 20, 30, if not 40 years to develop. And what we were advising is that you have to make sure it doesn't go into decline, that the, the site needs, the territory needs to keep bubbling away, providing jobs, services, residential spaces and things. Otherwise, if you go to Tabula Rasa, it would be really detrimentally quite impactful for the surrounding neighborhoods, which are already kind of on their knees. And it would also be very difficult to then rev it up again. And what we didn't want to do is just sort of wait for 20 years and then supplant a whole new neighborhood on top of it. So one of the, um, uh, and then for the Meanwhile Project, our brief was quite ambitious. Um, we were asked to, to try to provide um, 20 to 30 year public spaces, um, 3000 jobs, um, and to secure land values, which is a sort of financial reality of, of, of the procurement strategy that the council are undertaking in buying up the land themselves. So this is one, just one image of, 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 of many <laughs> documents where we're trying to provide public realm infrastructure that starts to sit, stitch the site together. There's big as, um, issues of access across the site. It's all quite parceled up. It never has really been one urban territory. And what we're trying to do is start to make that urban territory. Um, I mean, these are some of the, the humble kind of projects that were um, that have been installed or implemented so far in terms of um, temporary public realm infrastructure, which don't necessarily look particularly sexy, but they allow new routes across the site and, and start to overcome some of the barriers of roads, canals, rivers, rail infrastructure, and hopefully allow more access and inclusivity and, and therefore access to employment. Um, and one of the... the one of the, the beautiful uh, circumstances that came about of it was, was there's a new station at eight, um, Meridian Water Station, which is now being completed, it was one of the first sort of flagship projects to be done. And you could get there on the train and get off the train and stand on the platform, but then you couldn't get off the platform because there's no public realm, so you'd have to get back on the train again. Um, so one of the first things we worked on was uh, was the designs for this um, temporary station square, so you could actually get off the, the the train. And then these were proposals for this for this urban site, which was um, for again a meanwhile project for workspaces and creative workspaces and startup spaces for local businesses. And we also worked with a local education um, team and uh, library services to try to provide skill spaces and training spaces. Um, so this is um, some of, uh, and these are some of the more sort of architectural or placemaking um, uh, images that we were working on, trying to find some sort of aesthetic that said meanwhile <laughs> and said public realm and said inclusivity, but also had a sort of industrial quality to it to try to sort of make an architecture and place out of that. So it didn't feel alien anymore. And on the, the top there is an image of the, the station square as, a, again, a sort of humble project, but at least a public space and an event space just before the train started arriving. OK, so what I want to focus on in the last however long I have, five minutes, four minutes, um, is the majority of my talk, which is um, the Stonehill Industrial Estate, which um, we've been working on for the last um, five or six Years. So this is a large swathe of industrial land within um, Enfit, within the Meridian Waters development. So this is just a, one of many pages of a spreadsheet of us analysing and getting to know all of the businesses and industries there um, in a sort of a deep manner. And, and there's a big range of, of industries from kind of car manufacturing to meatpacking industries to then building construction materials, windows and doors and then artists and great, quite amazing kind of sculptors and things all packed into this um, industrial estate. And these give a flavor of some of the, the, the spaces which have so much potential if you look at them in that way. Um, we have some quite actually historic industrial buildings, uh, sort of iconic 
this is a, a was um, a, a really great social enterprise, which is a shared um, creative workspace and workshops with a library, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then just some of the yard spaces. I think the external spaces are equally as important as the built spaces. And the thresholds between them, like the edges of the buildings and spaces are really like urban kind of foregrounds where there's intense activity of goods and people. And, and it's really cool, like these operational facades. Um, this gives some more examples. At the top was one of our favorite spaces, which is a covered arcade through the industrial estate. And when you look at it from above in aerial view, it looks like one massive um, warehouse. But when you go inside it, there's all sorts of covered streets and spaces and service spaces and a kind of multitude of different industries. And they have so much urban potential if it was unlocked. And then this is... <laughs> Um, this was actually a club and a wedding venue, <laughs> um, but unfortunately there was a fatal shooting at a wedding um, a couple of days before we went to the site, so we've never been allowed in there and it's, it's closed, but um, no, but for obvious reasons, but it gives a sense of the potential for maybe strange or exciting um, uh, forms of cultural and social life taking place in these conditions. Um, and the, some of those sort of more informal um, spaces on the edges of it that are quite hard to define. Okay, so we, similar to some of uh, Leanne and Brooker's work, um, did a sort of typological analysis and we're trying to explain what the different and catalogue the different architectural and urban typologies and the way they perform, um, and then ways to play with them. And if I may extend by 30 seconds, this is our favourite. I mean, there's these hybrid typologies, which is just so cool, where you've got kind of very functional urban buildings with all these offices and uh, workshops and sales offices on the ground floor, but then linking to manufacturing spaces behind, which then have a more sort of um, industrial elevation on the other side. And then at the ends of these blocks, there's um, public staircases and public services and toilets and things. And then these Orwellian corridors that feel like streets on the first floor with loads of other offices. And we're just, quite in love with all of these. They have so much potential for then adding to them or learning from them and how could, and primarily for us and our next brief is how could they start to support residential fabric and housing. Um, and this was explorations about if we are, if this is going to happen, how could we create a kind of appropriate tone of public space? That's five minutes, right? One minute. Okay, so then moving on, this is one building that has been finished, um, one project that has been finished, again, funded by the, the, the Mayor of London, the GLA, and it's a building by Fifth Studio, which is one of our partner practices in this work, um, where they've taken the building blocks building, I was saying, and created a new facility, which is um, a social enterprise and is a shared um, workshop manufacturing space for small businesses. And again, architecturally playing with what this sort of industrial architecture might be like and how you create working public yards and then public spaces for, for recreation and, and, and other things. So to finish, what, what we're doing now is the, the latest master plan has this broadband concept and the concept of the broadband is for an industrial workspace that cuts through the um, residential, the predominantly residential led urban, um, uh, uh, urban development. And we're now in the process of trying to test that. So this is our industrial estate. We're trying to find ways in which we can meet the development realities of um, the residential fabric. We need to provide 400 homes in this strip whilst retaining some of the existing industrial units and then learning from our hybrid typologies and providing hybrid mixed use blocks that have different scales of industrial spaces and residential um, units above or integrated. And what might a public realm be that integrates sort of um, ecological spaces and recreational spaces with then working yards and industrial yards. And this is our exploration of, I'll whiz through these, don't worry, of some of the, taking some of the existing typologies and seeing how they might support different kinds of residential fabric and, and what the scales of those might be and predominantly advocating for um, different kinds of residential units that aren't allowed for in the in the development so micro units live work units etc cetera, etc cetera, that are more um, supportive of the idea of the broadband and to close um, I wanted to close with two now academic collaborations we're about to go into with them one is looking at the, um, with, with Central St. Martins, one is looking at the um, wetlands because we're at the top of the Lee Valley and how could we use the wetland systems as a way to um, naturally regenerate the land, which is very contaminated from sort of two centuries or a century and a half worth of, of um, quite polluting industrial um, uses. 
And the other is they've just appointed a head of sustainability who is an architect, which is brilliant. And uh, we're working on a proposal to do a materials inventory of all the industrial materials that could be taken down in the, through the demolishing of, these, um, of the site and stored and then reused in new housing developments and, and building typologies. And this is just um, showing some of the work of our um, MA, MA architecture course and material cultures where they've been doing kind of replicas of housing typologies um, through carbon zero or carbon negative materials. So how could you rethink architectures through that? And we're going to try and build upon that and collect materials from the site and provide hopefully totems that start to put materials together and say, actually, this could be an aesthetic and a typology that is carbon zero and made of recycled materials. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Um, I have also to bring the greetings from the president uh, of our master's degree course in urban planning and design here in Prato, Daniela Poli, and uh, of course the, with the wish uh, to strengthen our cooperation also in future. Uh, there is a spoiler in, uh, in the title of my presentation about the origin of the building I am going uh, to talk about. Uh, the, the, the case is, uh, sorry for reading, but uh, this will uh, help me to keep uh, my presentation within 15 minutes. I hope so. I hope uh, I'll manage to do that. Uh, the case study I present is a very peculiar one. Uh, we are not in an industrial district, uh, uh, nor inside an urban pattern added to the city in the industrial period or modern times, uh, but uh, in the middle of a world heritage site that is the historic center of Florence, at a few minutes walking distance from some of the main monuments and points of interest of the city, including the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore, covered by Bruno Leschi's dome. More specifically, uh, we are in the heart of the neighborhood of San Lorenzo, which takes its name from the Basilica of San Lorenzo, also by Bruno Leschi, a unique compendium of Renaissance architecture and art, as well as the main market hall of the city, a remarkable example of 19th century industrial architecture, and uh, the Mercato of San Lorenzo, a street market, once very popular among the locals, now almost ex exclusively frequented by tourists. This map shows public and private buildings inside the neighborhood that are listed as national heritage. Um, uh, they are in total 77 and cover almost a quarter of its surface area. Besides buildings and private schools, university buildings and the facilities, they include a significant rate of abandoned buildings previously used for as offices, an old people's home, a hotel, a hospital now being transformed into a student hall and uh, to cinema and uh, the old tobacco factory, that one, I am uh, going to talk about, which is very close to the San Lorenzo market. The building, uh, forming almost entirely a block of the historic center, is also named after a saint, Sant'Orsola, which uh, may sound odd for a tobacco factory. This is because it was originally a monastery built at the age of the medieval city uh, in Dante's time and uh, later incorporated into the urban fabric. Incidentally, archival sources attest that uh, Lisa Gerardini del Giocondo, the famous Mona Lisa portrayed by Leonardo da Vinci, was buried in uh, the church in this convent after spending her last years uh, assisted by her daughter, a nun of Sant'Orso. 500 years uh, after its uh, foundation, um, during which the monastery had become bigger and bigger, Florence was under Napoleonic rule. In this period, Sant'Orsola was confiscated and acquired as a public property, 
has occurred uh, to many other convents, which became uh, public schools, uh, military barracks, or prisons. The confiscation of religious properties continued even after the reunification of the Kingdom of Italy in the second half of the 19th century. In recent times, barracks and prisons have been uh, uh, often converted again uh, to other uses like uh, museums or, or university buildings. Uh, a very interesting example in Florence uh, is uh, the complex of uh, Le Murate, a 15th uh, century uh, convent that became a prison and is now a very lively place of the city, uh, organized around the squares created from uh, the convent's courtyards with a functional mix on the ground floor and social housing on the upper floors. As far as Sant'Orsola is concerned, the building was assigned to the general administration of tobacco, which was and continued to be for a long time, even under the Italian Republic, a state monopoly. By 1818, the complex was therefore adapted to be a tobacco factory by architect Bartolomeo Silvestri, who reorganized it in a very rational manner, according to an enlightenment approach, producing some fascinating spaces, such as the large clock courtyard. The Sant'Orsola Tobacco Factory continued to produce uh, cigarettes and uh, the famous uh, Tuscan cigars, uh, very strong cigars, uh, until 1940, when production was transferred to the huge new factory, Manifattura Tobacchi, you visited it, I think, uh, built during fascism on the outskirts of the city. Also closed in the 1980s, it is now, as well as Sant'Orsola, one of the most interesting areas undergoing transformation in Florence. After the Second World War, the abandoned factory at Sant'Orsola was used as a temporary shelter for displaced people and later, until the early uh, 1970s, as a home for evicted people. From that moment on, for over 50 years, every attempt to reuse the complex failed. A project to convert it uh, into a service center of the University of Florence was uh, soon abandoned. Then, in the mid-1980s, Sant'Orsola was destined to, destined to become headquarters and barracks of the financial police, Guardia di Finanza. The innovation works, disruptive and disrespectful of the historical significance of the complex was never completed. Since 1990, Sant'Orsola has been left in a state of neglect and subject to progressive degradation. In 20, 2007, it was acquired from the state by the province of Florence with the constraint of maintaining public ownership of the building. Between 2009 and 2011, the province technical office drew up a renovation project based on a functional mix, including a high school and an art academy. But these two was abandoned due to lack of funding. At the request of the archeological superintendents, however, an excavation campaign was carried out, which brought to light the remains of the church where Mona Lisa was buried. In the following, following years, the province and the metropolitan city of Florence, which replaced the province in 2015, unsuccessfully tried to involve private investors with four different calls for bids. In the meantime, special openings of the, architecture, of the archaeological area and temporary installation realized uh, on the street facade of the building by the artist Vaclav uh, Pisviec in collaboration with the local association uh, Insieme per San Lorenzo, together for San Lorenzo, turned the spotlight on the complex. In 2012, the civic group Sant'Orsola project was born to urge the reuse of Sant'Orsola as a catalyst of urban regeneration of the neighborhood to counteract the gentrification process driven by over tourism. In fact, the demand generated by tourism has substantially changed over years the socioeconomic fabric of the neighborhood 
progressively replacing traditional shops with mini markets, restaurants, and businesses and uh, tourists. How tourism um, leads uh, the expulsion of residents is evident looking at this map produced by exporting the data of rooms and apartment offered on Airbnb short rental platform before the pandemics. Almost 1,200 accommodation, most of which managed by professional agency, may be found just in such a limited uh, extension of the city center, in addition to the offer of the traditional hotels of 300 registered in the same area. In 2014, San Torsola project organized La Città Dentro San Lorenzo, the city inside San Lorenzo, a festival of readings, music, and exhibition inside San Torsola. The event attracted over 3,000 visitors in three days, achieving wide media coverage. Such initiatives succeeded in increasing citizens' awareness of the great potential of this urban block that had remained inaccessible for so long. With an overall built up area of more than 70,000 square meters and an extension of courtyards and colonnades of approximately 2,500 square meter, square meter usable as public space in the very center of the city, it was finally clear that Sant'Orsola represents a strategic asset both for San Lorenzo neighborhood and the whole city. In 2018, while waiting for new proposal for the, from the private sector, the Metropolitan City decided to allocate about 4 million euros in urgent restoration works, starting with the repair of the roof to prevent further damages to the buildings. Against this backdrop, an action research took place in 2019 aimed at defining, uh, at defining a shared strategy for a socially sustainable regeneration of San Lorenzo neighborhood, leveraging on the, re, the redesign of public space and the reuse of Sant'Orsola. The initiative, named uh, San Lorenzo Laboratory, was coordinated by the Department of Architecture of the University of Florence in partnership with the Sant'Orsola project and the Order of Architects of Florence. It was endorsed by the Metropolitan City of Florence and funded with 25,000 euros by the Authority for Civic Participation of the Region Toscan. The San Lorenzo Laboratory was conduct conducted on a two-track basis. On one side, updated data and maps to describe the cultural, social, and economic feature of the neighborhood, some of which have been used in this presentation, were gathered and uh, rendered by research, researchers of the Department of Architecture. On the other hand, all partners supported by a professional facilitator led a participatory process involving inhabitants, local stakeholders, experts, and public officials in the building up of the strategy to orient public policies on San Lorenzo and Sant'Orso and as a model for the whole historic center. Officially, the lab laboratory started in March with, uh, with a kickoff meeting attended by the representatives of about 20 civic associations and a cultural institutions active in the San Lorenzo neighborhood, and ended in December with uh, the presentation at Palazzo Medici Riccardi, the house of the Metropolitan City of Florence, of the proposal and requests uh, resulting from the participatory pro process um, uh, to the involved uh, insti institutions. However, the collaboration between uh, the three um, uh, promoters of the initiative has uh, continued and uh, is still ongoing. The participatory process was structured in different steps as shown in this uh, slide. Backstage work session of the partner teams Activities of community engagement, such as a reconnaissance trip through the neighborhood with the citizens and stakeholders, focus groups, interviews to strategic actors in the field of culture, economy, and in the social field, sharing dissemination and communication activities, activities including an information stall in Piazza San Lorenzo, a public meeting with experts, public officers, and politicians. 
The clue of the process was a one-day community design workshop aimed at turning the many suggestions collected during the nine months into concepts and action plans for the regeneration of the neighborhood and of Sant'Orsola with the support of the expert of the Department of Architecture and the Order of Architects. As far as the complex of Sant'Orsola is concerned, where the most important game for the future of the neighbor is played, a non-negotiable point arising from the discussion is to make it fully permeable to pedestrian, transforming its courtiers and colonnades into a pattern of public space. The consequent request is to make it live with mixed use function addressed to the city and the residents rather than to attract mass tourism. The hypothesis put forward to give a new life to the century old building range from a place for culture, education and performing art uh, to a civic center with the spaces for sport, children and elderly, a school and exhibition center dedicated to arts and crafts or a hub for innovation, urban creativity and high education. The debate developed during the health crisis caused by the coronavirus on the need to rethink the models of economic and urban development created a favorable condition for the absorption of the requests and suggestions made by the laboratory into the public policies of the city. The repopulation of historic neighborhoods, the increase of public facility and green areas along with the care of existing public space the diversification of economic activities, the regulation of tourism rentals, and the promotion of a more sustainable tourism are all themes widely discussed in the laboratory and highlighted in its reports that have been included as key points for the relaunch of the World Heritage Area in the program Rinasce Firenze, Florence Reborn, launched by major Dario Nardella as a response to the pandemic, a significant change of pace compared to the years of laxity to the ongoing touristic uh, tourist Despite uh, the difficulties of the moment, the turning point for Sant'Orsola arrived in the middle of the pandemic with the signing of a concession contract for the complex between the Metropolitan City and the French real estate company Artea. The project by Artea, which will be will be a, all the cost of restoration of the former monastery and then manage it for 99 years, takes into account many of the requests and proposals made by the San Lorenzo Laboratory, uh, presented directly to the company by the partners of the laboratory itself. In fact, the project provides the transformation of the courtyards into public spaces, including a green area, the opening of the complex on all sides of the block, the use of one of the basement levels originally intended for parking as a gymnasium, the introduction of elements of contemporary art on the external facade of the complex uh, altered by the works uh, of the 90s. On the other hand, a front of uh, discussion still uh, open concerns the type of school of higher education uh, with adjoining guest house uh, to be located on the upper floors. The hypothesis of a hospitality management school sponsored by the municipality, but considered by the partners of the laboratory contradictory with the idea of Sant'Orsola as a catalyst of innovation seems to have been ruled out for the time being. Finally, the choice of the San Lorenzo neighborhood for a pilot project of revitalization of the economic fabric affected by the pandemic launched one year ago by the city of Florence can be easily related to the discussion within the laboratory. By means of a public tender, the municipality has acquired some abandoned commercial spaces located in the streets adjacent to Sant'Orsola to be allocated to art and crafts activities, including the training of young apprentices. The goal is to recreate a craft district in the historic center capable of reviving and innovating a tradition of excellence of the city. 
Additional resources have been allocated to repair streets paving and new public lighting in the area. Not all decisions have been taken and vigilance will still be needed to ensure that the intervention actually go in the desired direction. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Really nice to be here. Um, and actually really nice to be able to gesticulate, although I'll try and stay tethered to the microphone. It can be hard. Um, we'll begin with the title. You'll notice I've borrowed Alex's title and I wanna take it on a ride through a couple of contexts. So through a site that we're working on in Bilbao as CSM as part of T-Factor, but that I also think is really interesting in terms of how productive ecologies can work at the scale of a territory, a sort of heritage site of industry, but also being newly formed, um, and then at the scale of the city and the region. So it might also just be really interesting as a reference territory. And then through a series of, of practices, curatorial strategies that take the temporary in different directions as reference strategies. Um, there are also two very different kinds of productive ecologies in terms of how I'm working on them. In the um, Bilbao context and through teaching on MA Cities, we take live projects, live partners, and normally more than one partner. Um, and we look at how we can work together across scales and through curriculum and through that being in a productive relationship with a site. So serving both, both sides. And then through art commissioning work, we were looking at a similar ecology, almost like a triangle, where there's a conversation that's productive between an artist, a site, and kind of the live project quality, um, and a community, however that's defined. So it can both shape a practice as well as shape an area. Cool. So we'll zoom right into Bilbao in the Basque Country, which is... Um, it's an area that's been industrially dense since medieval times. Doesn't have a huge amount of land that isn't at about 50 to 60 degrees. And so it has huge amounts of water coming down to what are now two um, mega super ports. Um, and it's also been a center of um, mining and extraction and metal production since medieval times. So from swords to tanks to now increasingly innovation, technology and investment in um, in innovation in the region, but that wasn't what I was going to talk about. So here's Bilbao. You'll have heard of the river because of the Bilbao effect, um, regeneration, kind of very classic reference for regeneration based around doing up the waterfront and revitalizing an, an industrial area that was right next to the 19th century extension. At the moment, that sort of lozenge is, gonna, is about to be one of the biggest regeneration projects in Europe and is the site we're gonna talk about. So there's a second phase of river that's shaping the city um, and the direction of the city's kind of cultural and potentially um, institutional production as well. So universities are looking to move to the site. Oh, what I also wanted to say about this in terms of how the city government is working and thinking about the site they worked on the first stretch of the river. This is very like simplified. And then they've been working on a green ring and thinking about the connection to the exurban and to the kind of steep sides that also used to be industrial. So tin smelting, et cetera. And um, so opening up the city and how the city's used. And then they're beginning to work on the second section of the river. So you go from having quite a segmented city um, both industrially and in terms of the use of the area and how you might connect between neighborhoods um, to the strategy of, of doing this, then this, and then connecting through with the green again. I put in a historical map, um, partly because of the red lines on there. Can you see the shape of the lozenge sort of hanging above the river? So in the 1920s and 30s, they decided that they wanted um, to be able to turn with really big boats so when it was still a, a, a working port um, so they started cutting through a channel which they didn't finish because by then the kind of level of industrial production and scale of ships and industry had moved further out to what is the current super port and so it was left unfinished 
until about three years ago, the final cut through, which is kind of the narrow end at the top of the image, um, was made. And this went from being a industrial area connected to a working class neighborhood to being a kind of an island and being spoken about for the first time as a new island in the city, um, which I just find really interesting, but also tells you around about kind of fluctuating identities that are sometimes brought in at the master planning level um, and how there might be conversations about a territory happening that seem to talk about the same thing, but actually there are not just different communities, but different memories and different conceptions of what a waterside is. I'm definitely going off topic. This is the Saha Hadid master plan. Looks a lot like her 1980s drawings, um, but doesn't really relate to the situation on the ground in terms of how, well, maybe it does because it approaches it as a very blank slate, tabula rasa. We've sort of removed a bunch of industry, raised the ground by, I think about six meters in preparation. It's like a mass creation of pressure and foundations for the island. Um, but that image doesn't really relate to the ecologies that T-Factor are beginning to work with, which are around the creative sector Taking up that giant wall is the wall of, um, I think, the biggest biscuit factory in Spain, historically, um, and is full of about 30, um, 30 creative industries, a cafe, public space. Um, it's all on the water. It's got a really thriving market. Um, there's more to say here. These are the, the founders of the space. Um, and it's also a space that's connected much more to the rest of the city. So just as the island is now spoken about as kind of a new blank slate opportunity area where, where the relationship to the city is quite new and it's disconnected, this has become a real hub kind of across the neighborhoods, bringing together these industries, um, a fab lab working regionally, internationally a bit, a film school that already has about 300 students next door, um, a circus school. Um, I'm going to pause and say I made these screenshots of the first things that come up because part of the issue that we're looking at in T Factor is the invisibility of these activities as performance, as dispersed communities, as changing and growing communities that are bringing the, the island, and I use the word loosely, um, into increasing connection with the rest of the city for the first time and, and much more than ever. Um, but are often quite hard to capture both as communities and as productive activities. Um, there is a, a climbing school. And then as an example of how this is already working internationally and is being recognized, it's, the, it's been the training center for about three years for the Chinese Olympic climbing team, while at the same time seeming kind of invisible um, with its industrial exterior and also in the way that it's perhaps described locally while being really recognized internationally. So that's the site um, that we've been invited to get involved in as a number of higher education institutions, working with some of those local um, creative industries, but also collectives effectively who are working across their local institutions, whether it's the film school, um, the studios, the market, to begin to think how they can lobby to be seen as a whole um, and to begin talking to policy as an ecology and not as individual kind of creative sector. So there are many ways of co-designing and collaborating um, and working together. And I mean, I've, I've pulled up these numbers partly because they're some of the things you might be interested in, but also because we're working in this really complex world of on the one hand, this level of change and the the amount of development that will happen on the island, and then the invitation to work really delicately on questioning what it might be that we learn with a 10 students here, 10 students there, like what might you seed? So with that question in mind, I'm gonna fast track to, as you begin to think about co-design and how you might create a kind of meanwhile moment in the city, one of the most interesting conversations that came out of the T-Factor post-it session was beginning to look for cyclicality and circularity, like take the temporary as something that marks a moment and begin, you're gonna to have to trust me on this because I don't expect you to read the post-its, but thinking about um, 
temp kind of temporary cycles within landscape design, thinking about existing moments that the whole city marks in a way. So Easter in Spain is a really big thing, got quite a lot of religious resonance, but much more um, also pagan resonance. How might the moment of spring be marked and then bring the island into um, a, a bigger network of kind of marking seasonal moments um, and how that then works within the seasonality of a curriculum where rather than kind of studying with one group of students a thing and trying to collaborate really intensively with community and then closing it there, how might you pass on a baton so that there's a conversation and a dialogue that keeps going year on year and builds up another level of resilience and local knowledge and exchanges knowledge, recognizing the temporal as cyclical. So I found this a really powerful response to being invited to work in the complexity of the kind of numbers that we really enjoy as urbanists, that we can visualize at one scale, but that quite often um, the sense of getting involved in relation to those numbers is around like the feeling of erasure or, or impotence, or how might we build up an evidence base to speak to policy or speak to power and actually bringing it in just much more into the design of the co-design itself. Um, and so that got me thinking about how we think through the temporary or the meanwhile as something we can redefine and think of the um, positive and longer term qualities, but also the really specific questions that the temporary can ask, not just that it will end or that it might seed an idea, but what kind of ideas are we looking to test in each particular thing? Um, I love this piece of public art, which was co-commissioned by the um, public art commissioning charity I used to work for, because it's, if you Google it, it's by Jeremy Della. It was commissioned for 2012 called Sacrilege, originally for the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. Um, you will find really sunny pictures of people bouncing, children kind of working across generations. It was so popular because it's fun and it's funny that it's still touring the globe. So actually it's temporality never did, it never was temporary even though it was intended to be because it was really popular. But I love this because what really made the piece and part of the conversation with the city and triangulating with public authorities and with a form of local community was working with the park officers from the council to set it up. How do you talk about the installation of a public artwork? How do you talk about questioning um, safety and play? Not with producers brought from an art gallery who would get it and who could equally have been commissioned, but behind the scenes and in the corridors and in that kind of bureaucratic melee of production, begin having other conversations that might not be as visible when you, when you Google it, but really leave a trace in Glasgow and potentially also then as that gets embedded into the commission and the question you ask, tour, tour the world with it too, I hope. So here are some more inflatables. Um, must have been a, a bit of a thing at the time. This is also around, I think, 2012 to 13. It was the first time that Freeze Art Fair decided to have something offsite, something a bit cooler in a kind of grittier neighborhood um, and approached us to have a think about where, where that might be. So with Sometimes you can begin using those triangulations to think about how um, something like saying freeze art fair might open a door that might not otherwise have been opened, not so much to inflatables, but to the general public too. So sometimes, um, I mean, this was just a weekend show, but sometimes that can really transform a space, even if you don't intend to, but you begin by asking that question, you know, this is a door that hadn't been opened in 30 years. It was a public baths so that there had been um, kind of local community lobbying to reopen um, for a long time and hadn't been getting very far. And with that curiosity about what the building might be like, um, and after about 20,000 people had gone through the door a day, um, suddenly it was much, much easier, both for the local council to rethink of it as a, a public amenity and as a really vital, space as part of the city and it was much easier to fundraise too, leaving freeze completely aside. Um, so these are now um, functioning public baths in Poplar in East London and probably way over time. Um, and that's to introduce the idea that sometimes a very temporal like two-day inflatables high-end art fair say public commission can be the beginning of a longer conversation and a curatorial strategy that can detach from that temporary moment. 
It doesn't always seed the strategy, but it might just seed the access to that key to the door. This is um, a different kind. So we're just gonna flip through models that I enjoy. Um, some of them, again, from Create London, where I used to work. This was created with Assemble in Walthamstow, also in the east, northeast of London. Um, and it's, a, it's an openly accessible workshop with really high-end tools. So the idea being like, how do you, if you wanna mend your kitchen cupboard and want to get some help, you can access kind of really high-end workshops, but if you've graduated from an art school and can't afford um, to build your own yet, and you're like 10 commissions behind being able to have that level of kit, you can access yet another level of, of kit and freedom within this space. And seeding one facilitates the other. So there's a kind of gym membership where you can have like a gold star or gold membership and have the equivalent of, of a professional studio for not too much money, but you're likely to end up helping the 85 year old man who's fixing his cupboard and doesn't necessarily know how to use the machines. So it creates a new community around a question about lack of access for, for young designers and how that might seed into the community. Um, it's a curatorial strategy in terms of policy that worked well enough that now that gym membership approach is relatively common, but you also sit in meetings with the GLA where they say, it's called Black Horse Workshop, I'd like a black horse. Um, and it isn't so much that you transpose the model, but it begins that conversation about what is the new membership model maybe, or what is the need that it might be meeting since this already works elsewhere. Um, I'm out of time. This is nothing to do with me other than that I really respect this work. So I recommend you have a look, um, but it's taking this question of how you might influence supply chains in relation to climate, in this case in, in Skye in Scotland, looking at, um, local food there and what forms of local food might kind of rip apart the local environment effectively and which might not. So it begins to have conversations about mussels and about salmon in the restaurant supply chain. And through um, the public moment built with students um, and really well publicly communicated, a series of conversations with the higher end restaurants that serve the huge tourist industry began. Um, and there was again, a kind of back room series of conversations which led to menu change. But I'll guide you to the website. I'm going to fast track um, to this, which is the last thing I worked on as a curator. And it was a hundredth anniversary of the biggest housing estate in the world at one time, um, still in Europe, and the biggest public, public authority built housing estate. And what I find powerful here are two things. I've not shown any of the work. I'm very happy to pull it up over lunch because this could be probably two hours conversation. Um, but commissioning a series of artists, not just to memorialize or not just to celebrate that number. I mean, 100 years is pretty arbitrary, but to look at the gaps in what are in those 100 years. So there's a very heavily fetishized early phase around the municipal and the archival, the post-war Homes for Heroes. There's then kind of a gap in the archive. There's work around the municipal. There's a lot around decline. Um, so thinking about different conversations and different communities and what community might be for a single question or a single moment. The other thing I really love about this curatorial strategy is that because the number 100 in itself didn't say much, it was a moment to mark, and I think in Italian you have the same sense of kind of marking a moment um, or the same meaning, to look forward and to begin thinking about what if we mark now, what might that mean in two years, in 10 years, in 20, around bringing in cyclical commissioning and understanding the role of seeding kind of public amenity, but conversations also about public amenity and really focused conversations with differentiated community groups. Um, and here we have everything from international artists who've represented their country at Venice to local artists working on, on podcasts and with teenagers in the care system. So all treated within the same curatorial strategy and effectively in a conversation with each other in the network. Um, and then the final thing I'll say about this, which has to do with the marking, not so much in terms of celebration, but in terms of bureaucracy and potential policy impact, is that it was funded by something called the Strategic community infrastructure levy, um, which is the term for the tiny slice of money that gets taken from developers to fill in potholes effectively. So kind of how do you support public infrastructure? Um, and so 
very publicly talking about the funding stream was a way of also talking about what, what does public and community infrastructure mean and how might that be at the center of each of these artworks, which are still standalone artworks in their own right. Um, so those are some thoughts of what we're hoping to learn from in, in Thorotfaure and in beginning to kind of mark with curriculum design and kind of really punctual small moments, something slightly more cyclical. I should stop. No, I won't do the end. Hi, my name is Justin Malia. I've written down a first paragraph in case I forget my name. I'm a practicing architect and a PhD candidate at Monash University. I'm based mainly in Australia and Italy with projects in various locations, but most are in Australia. My research is based in Italy. My practice is personally driven, so involves small scale works, but also through collaboration has seen my involvement in large projects. So this is the point of view through which I'm addressing the themes of today's symposium through fine grained detailed work with an awareness and engagement with broader considerations. To describe this way of working, I will quickly show a few projects that show smaller scale types of work we are engaged with, which are relevant to the symposium's theme, but I will primarily present two projects, both located in the inner city of Melbourne. The first is an example of finely detailed construction completed about 13 years ago in Richmond, which serves as a constructed precedent for the second project, which is in Northcote and still under design, currently towards the end of the council planning approval stage. First though, I wanted to show these images, which are of the um, Vickers Ruwalt factory, the former factory uh, in the inner city of Melbourne, just because I like them a lot, but it really shows the, the, the scale and the, the, the materiality and the, the strength of what was going on in these places. There's you know, cylinders and cogs and gears, everything's enormous and um, you know, lava being poured. It was all housed inside this enormous factory, uh, which was almost entirely made of corrugated iron. Um, I mean, I grew up in this area and remember these buildings uh, before they were gentrified, or in this case, uh, dropped to the ground. I mean, there was these sorts of forms and shapes and structures that as architects, we find interesting and we sort of want to engage with. But then the reality that happens like on that site is that it was it was leveled and it became the Victoria Gardens shopping center and Ikea store. So this enormous industrial complex got leveled and a big blue box and a multi-level car park and some fairly bland apartments uh, you know, uh, are, are what replace it. And it's not to glorify the past or, the, or to talk about negatively in the functions that are there now compared to the functions that were there before because because um, because rural would have been creating mining equipment they probably were contaminating the soil polluting the river you know ikea probably has good environmental things that they're doing but it's this physical engagement of what the architecture actually achieves where there's no street engagement there's fire hose reel cupboards and you know sprinkler valves that all not only have doors but have big signs on them telling you all of that and even though there's greenery in these images that sort of masks what's going on, really you're looking into a multi-level car park with artificial lighting on a bright sunny day. I mean, again, with the apartments, there's nothing wrong with horizontal bands or gridded facades, but the ground engagement is of parking, bollards, street signs, mirrored facades and glazed entry lobbies. I like this point of view of the world where you pretty much just see Australia, but I wasn't sure how much Rutger and um, Leanne would introduce where we're working, but this is zoomed in on the bottom of Australia to Melbourne. Um, there's the Yarra River, which uh, um, is where Melbourne's based. You can see the grid of the CBD. It's sort of set at 45 degrees. Um, and then as the river, the Yarra River curls around, you can see that there's this denser white area, which is the suburb of Richmond, where a couple of these projects are, lo are located. This is zooming in on it uh, here again. Um, and sorry, as here the, the Yarra River wraps its way around, as it gets to the top right hand corner of the page, there's Merry Creek, which moves up towards the north. So the first project I'm going to talk about is in Richmond, the other one is up the top in the, of the page in, in Northcote. Uh, zooming in more onto this Richmond area, I'll just quickly talk through some of the, uh, as I said, finer grain details of what we're considering here and operating in a, you know, previously industrial sort of area. 
this small block of land, which is tiny, it was a horizontal band located between uh, shops, the, the backs of shops that fronted onto a major road, and then the backs of houses that, uh, that faced in the opposite direction towards north. Um, again, this is another view of the same area, just to try to locate, give you a, an impression of where we are for those people that don't know Melbourne. Again, the same sort of view, this was the site that we were confronted with. Um, this included the street access to it. So the council through their own regulations had basically determined this space unbuildable because it was hard to achieve a building on there that would meet the planning requirements and the access requirements. As I said, between shops and residential, these are the sort of images of the surroundings. There's shops, there's nice houses, there's a lot of workers cottages. But again, a lot of what I want to talk about is this materiality of this corrugated metal in these small industrial buildings that are um, intermingled amongst also workers' cottages. I mean, now this area is all expensive real estate. Um, this was our specific site that arrived uh, through a small laneway. And this is the infill construction that uh, we provided on that space. So again, the architectural concept was to provide a structural frame that created a, a rhythm um, to the building to give it some unity, which was then infilled differently depending on whether it was facing to the south and to the rear of the shops and to the, and to the north, which opened up to the uh, residential areas and the greenery of those rear gardens. So, so one face, but all faces are functional. So this face towards the south enables, depending on what the ground floor occupation is, sometimes it was an office which would open up more onto the laneway and other times it, was, it needed a more filtered private uh, engagement. All the services and everything are also hidden behind these uh, battened facades. So one of the things that we're often doing is dealing with density and inserting a lot into a small space. So here there were three floor plans that were stacked on top of one on each, on top of one another and shifted laterally to enable access at ground floor for vehicles or, or pedestrians, but then shifted at the upper floors to give outdoor spaces and allow the penetration of sunlight and air. Again, this is a similar project currently under construction. We're again using that same material as an outer shell that gets stripped away in places to create an incredibly dense building fitting in against amongst, again, a laneway type uh, streetscape of roller doors and corrugated iron back sheds. I'm just going to jump through a couple of these more fine grained smaller projects that are all in industrial areas. This is a view of Florence. It's the Arno River. You can see the, um, the Duomo in the, in the center at the top of the page. And so, I mean, obviously the Italians in the room will know this and also Aldo for the Monash students presented this quickly uh, last week. But where the old walls of the city meet the Arno, uh, one wall comes in sort of down here at the bottom, the other wall wrapped in um, further up the page just before the, the second bridge you can see. And this gap in between is where traditionally the boats would come and unload. And from the 1800s onwards, it was, this, it was the first industrial precinct in Florence. It was fairly quickly moved further out of the, out of the city, but we're undertaking a project just in the bottom corner and the, on the bottom of the page on, on this view as well. Again, this is sort of, sort of unwanted property, like, uh, a lot of people like it and think it's a great idea. A lot of Italians especially have told me Italians wouldn't want to live here as a generalization. And so again, we're looking at materials, looking at uses, uh, inserting them. This is, this is a industrial building that gets converted into a um, residential and mixed use building. This is a project sort of the opposite of those examples. This is Mexico. Uh, that horizontal line three quarters of the way up the page is Trump's wall. So the fields at the top of the USA, the rest of it is this amazing city called Mexicali. It's basically one story houses, all of that. And so it's a bit of a reverse process where industrialization or commercialization is happening to residential space. And so our project is basically taking a, what was a house uh, that's now become valuable, more centralized part of all of that urban fabric that you just saw that becomes a co-working space. But the point, the project I wanted to arrive at is this, this <laughs> which is a 50 square meter footprint. It's seven meters by seven meters. It's located in, in Northcote. So this is the reverse view of Melbourne. So you can see the bay, the bay uh, beyond with the CBD and this diagonal green band is that Merry Creek that I mentioned before. Again, our site is just in the, in the bottom right-hand corner. 
an aerial view flipping over uh, to that we're facing north. You can see the green band of the creek and you can see the general urban fabric is, oh, there's a lot of houses in this area and those white rooftops are former industrial sites. This is an overlay of the planning scheme, which again, just reflects that same thing. The pink is houses, the green is the creek, the dark pink stripes are retail uh, um, streets, that's St George's Road. Um, and then these coloured boxes are uh, these former industrial sites. That speck that you can possibly see in the purple uh, area is our, is our commission site. As I said, it's seven metres by seven metres. But it's designated within these um, development overlay zonings, whereby it's areas that the council have designated as this is in former industrial land that's ripe for residential development and mixed use development. And so there's a lot of policies that are um, that were provided to us as to engage with in undertaking this proposal. Um, the more interesting or visually more interesting is this unlocking enterprise in a changing economy. It has all sorts of good graphs that involve the interlinking elements that are acquired, enterprise, augmented reality, engaging with the world, connecting, creating, all of these sorts of things. But then the example project that they gave me as a basis for how to prepare a development plan for this property was, the, and this the scale of this is enormous. So um, it's, it's quite a few hundred meters in each direction. Um, but you can see that the floor plan is a, is a big block and the, um, it's very car orientated, both in the cul-de-sac type arrangement of, um, of circulation and also the section where it's all about cars getting under the ground and then the interface that, that creates. I've purposely poured up a news article because the captions are sort of amusing, but also highlights part of the problem that happens with this interpretation of the reinvigoration of sites where there's a bit of a, a clearing of what was there, a clearing of this industrial um, precedent and then creation of new buildings where you know local councils are encouraging more shops but not more shoppers. Um, ghost shops haunt new apartment blocks as perfect storm hits suburban retailers. They stare at you in the middle ring suburbs of our major cities. Um, not a good look, empty shops drag down retail strips. I mean I think we all know about this sort of stuff but the problem that was specific to this project is that um, again, our, this is another version of the a zoomed in area. So um, the purple area is the uh, industrial area that's been um, designated for rejuvena rejuvenation. But within that area, there's these, there's these precincts. And with the exception of our site, which is, you can see that the red dot, which is our actual footprint, it's within a bigger rectangle. And so the other rectangles there are all owned by a single entity, so a single owner. So the idea is that someone rich or a corporation or something will buy that land and make a plan that engages with all these ideas and build a building on there, you know, hopefully a good one, but that's the process that happens. Instead, our site there, which is number 148, uh, involves 25 individual owners because the factories were originally subdivided already with separate ownership. And so the council's idea was that these, um, these factories would be all sold up to one developer in a coordinated way. That developer would then knock them all down and propose something back to the council. Um, this is a sort of one of the larger sites to the left of the subject site. It's, you can see it's an enormous old warehouse, but to the, to the east of the site, we have residential houses. This is the site itself. There's a central driveway with fairly small factories down each side of it. Pretty ugly stuff built, you know, around the start of the 2000s, around the sun, around the time that we were designing that infill that infill property that I mentioned at the start in Richmond. And so basically no one can do anything to this because the council won't give anybody a permit to do any works. So it has just stayed as an outer suburban uh, industrial park, uh, but inside these roller doors, there's fairly cheap rent and they're fairly cheap to buy as well because there's been so much limitations on what anybody can do because nobody could resolve this problem of um, 25 people all agreeing to sell up to a, to a developer. But the sort of things that are happening in those 25 um, occupancies, and these are real tenancies that are there or have recently left, but there's bicycle repair shop, locksmith, computer systems designer, fruit and vegetable distributor, coffee consultancy business. There's all sorts of things going on that even in the last three years that we've been involved with this, there's been lots of evolution in those, in those things. So with COVID, there's been 
um, new developments with delivery services and distribution uh, places. But also, I mean, it's right next to Mary Creek, which is a beautiful resource in itself. There's beautiful views from the rooftops. You can see the city. Um, there's lots of connections into adjoining um, industrial complexes and laneway systems and adjoining streets. So our task to do this one small project has become to do a development plan, plan for the whole precinct of those 25 uh, units. It's well connected to trams and trains in various directions and lots of local shops and infrastructure. As I said, there's good, connect, good existing connection where it's not this cul-de-sac type private um, circulation path, but a linking path between streets. And with these green arrows, you can see that there's also the ability for this existing path to be linked in with adjoining paths. So the existing scenario actually does a lot of the things the council were wanting to happen, but both in how the place is occupied and, and what this existing ugly infrastructure actually uh, achieves. Um, and so we've now convinced them that this should stay the way it is, that each individual owner can do their own development plan about how their individual property relates to the other 25 in our own precinct, as well as the broader precincts that are uh, in that surrounding area. So here you can see uh, the existing section um, of basically an existing fairly low rise, but very large industrial building. Then our small, our two small uh, components with the street down the middle, and then off to the right is the, the lower scale residential properties. So on here on the bottom is our master planned building envelopes, whereby we acknowledge that the large industrial sites are probably going to be developed into very large buildings, which is what the council wants. And so our site creates a buffer zone between those very big elements and these very small scale elements, which are the residences, by increasing in, in scale to enable that to happen in a more um, comfortable um, urban with more comfortable urban forms that avoid things like overlooking uh, for privacy reasons, but also enable over, actual overlooking and engagement with that central driveway area to try to bring more life to it. So this is an elevation of one side of that driveway where in very simple terms, we're talking about two or three storey extensions onto the roof of each of these small factories. Um, and our, our first project is one of these um, factories which involves a two-storey commercial um, premises uh, starting at ground floor with uh, living areas and bedrooms on upper floors and roof garden on, on the roof. This is all flexibly dividable, so it could be inhabited by one person or it could be uh, rented out to, to up to three tenancies throughout the different levels. We've since been engaged by another of these factories within the same complex, so we already have two projects within the same, within the same complex, but the idea is that over time and as demand dictates and how these things evolve, now that we've got a mechanism to free up the development on this site, the individual owners, depending on how ambitious they are with scale or what their precise purposes are, will develop up their property in their, in their own way. So you can see just the two that we've done, the first one is taller and denser, the other one is, is, is lower. But this is uh, the last slide. This is a um, High Street Northcote. And this is the sort of idea that we're trying to promote, that everybody, everybody loves this sort of thing. But at the moment, the interpretation of the, the good intentioned rules with council don't actually achieve this sort of thing. They're currently achieving the ABC News type article that I showed earlier. So that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> Wow, I'm um, got a very difficult job to try and find a spread through some very rich material. Um, not difficult job, I guess it's a uh, difficult choosing. I think is probably the um, probably the bit that I uh, I've got many questions. So I might ask one and then throw it to the audience, or if Ruth's got the online people there. Um, otherwise, I've got many more that I can keep going with. But what I might do is start with this um, idea of the tutorial. Um, but then also potentially the role of the architect or the role of the designer um, in, in capturing some of these processes. So I think that in various ways, um, it came up as um, through sort of co-design, let's say, and the curatorial practices and understanding ecologies, um, but potentially having a role in, in um, cohering the collective voices um, towards or to a singular voice like I hear or another actor, whether that's the city or not. 
um, to capturing then and the, the idea of sort of agency um, and I guess almost activism um, in the in the um, in the project work that you were showing, Francesco. Sorry. And I wonder whether or not you guys have comments in a way. And Justin, in some senses, um, it's not necessarily around the, the co-design process in an immediate project, but even in this last project, there is a little bit of a co-design and collectivity going on in that incremental way. Um, so I know that that's slightly broad, but I wonder if um, I might throw back to the beginning and see whether or not, Alex, you have a, um, have a take on the, the curatorial versus the capturing in your work and, and where and what you find sort of important for the, the kind of pinch pins, let's say. Um, thank you. I think the, the, with the Enfield project, we never really referred to it as curatorial, um, but I, I guess it is on, on lots of different levels and it's definitely about design. I think the, the, it's kind of a perfect project in some ways, an example of how architects and academics can work very well with local authorities and planners and um, to, to, to come up with a vision and a method of something and to sort of curate the design landscape for the next 20 or 30 years. I think if the main developer hadn't dropped out, <laughs> um, then none of that would have happened because it would have been a more straightforward urban design regeneration proposal with a master plan that would have been given to a main developer and built out over time. Because that didn't happen, um, we were able to work with the, the, the council immediately to start to say, well, what do we do for the next 20 or 30 years? And that's where we came up with the idea of the, the 20 year, meanwhile, we call it a strategy rather than a master plan to start to curate, if you like, um, the development of the area and how to keep it going and then how to, to, to design and implement projects that start to almost shoehorn in the larger scale developments that are coming. And I think that gave us as a sort of, it was not just our practice, a, a number of practices, um, a wonderful opportunity to sort of plan with design thinking at strategic levels and have that kind of very close relationship with the client team and then to affect actual design proposals and changes and to see what 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 the what, what the impact of those are and what the next step might be. I think the, the other thing I was going to say, which is slightly spoilers, but I think in the context of us being an academic conference here as well as a, a practitioner conference, the head of one of the head lead designers um, in the regeneration team on the council side was one of our students from a long time ago, and now the head of planning um, in the local authority is one of Mel's students. Um, uh, and I'm just saying that because I, I think that level of academic and or acknowledgement of kind of academic design led research and the ability to speak at all of those different levels is really, really important. And I think because of some of those key players, they're able to, to get the sort of the, the big politicians within the local authority to, to, to engage with us. We've never really had that issue with the Greater London Authority because that's full of us and all of our students and ourselves have all worked there and curatorial practices work very well at the scale of a mayor and a, a kind of a design panel within the mayor, but getting it into sort of the realities of urban design at local authority level was much more difficult. But I think that's why it could be quite emblematic. Mm. But I guess my final point was that the curatorial doesn't really need to be at the scale of just the space. I think being able to cross the scales and talk about them all at the same time for them all to be present, I think is really important. And that, that's, that was quite a gift. I might add a little bit of definition about how the word curatorial has maybe helped my thinking around something that I feel has been long seeded in architecture. So the idea of design for public good, the idea of taking a question or two and testing it, you know, even if it takes you 10 years to build through a building that is exemplary, that where it, there's a, a visible change in the city that is tethered to a space um, or, a, or a part of the built environment. Um, I think curatorial is beyond, in this case, it was about art commissioning out in the world. So there was a very deliberate use of the word in terms of giving um, a certain narrative or, or a certain um, international carrying power as well to the work we were doing. We could equally have called it something else, but it's also about the practice of knowing the practices of those that you're commissioning. And I would include here um, the definition of what community groups you're working with. So taking a curatorial approach to thinking about who, what space, group and artists you're working with. 
Um, and so, for example, if we were working with an um, older women's tea group, kind of who they might work with well and what that conversation was. And um, the other thing is about editing. And I feel like perhaps like editing um, this sense that when you are given this complexity, when I pulled up the, the numbers that tend to come with an urban plan or let's say an urban problem or kind of the complexity within which we work, we sometimes try to treat everything. And something about saying this show or commission or moment or building is testing this one thing or speaking to this one thing, and then we'll move it on um, with the next, or it will fit into a longer trajectory of that practice, um, I found really useful. I can talk all day, so. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that the, your question has much to do with, uh, with the role of, uh, architect in society, of course. And uh, I mean, architects from uh, academic world or as professional or also as a, uh, a technician in a public administration. And uh, I think that we have a social role. We are probably in the middle between, uh, between the uh, institutional realm and uh, citizens and the stakeholders. And so I think that we also have a role of meeting to let uh, these people talk each other. That was uh, the experiment we, we attempted uh, with uh, uh, San Lorenzo Laboratory. Architects were there uh, in, from a university and also from the order of architects, so professionals. But we worked together with uh, um, a social group, uh, with an association, uh, uh, trying to uh, build a um, shared vision about a piece of the city to uh, uh, communicate to uh, the institutions who couldn't manage that problem since years. And uh, Finally, what we provided was not extraordinary as, a, as a, um, an architectural output, but was uh, the, uh, the, the driver mm -hmm. for, for following steps, which are perhaps going in a desirable direction. <laughs> So then other architects who are now working for the real estate, for the developer, are uh, trying to um, meet uh, people uh, um, um, expectations with, of course, uh, uh, the, the um, objectives of the developers. And uh, again, uh, public uh, institutions uh, are um, assisting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think that we have to uh, um, uh, play this role with, uh, our, with our expertise from the, uh, from, from the territory to the, to the, to the site. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, if, if we do that, uh, we can perhaps uh, be the missing uh, ring between society and, uh, and uh, public uh, decisors. Yeah, very good. Justin, um, I guess trying to speak about curatorial ideas with the content that I just presented. I think um, maybe of relevance is that there's a bit of a mismatch possibly between the intentions of these policies and when you know the upper echelon of everybody are interacting to make something happen and when it filters down to the to the broader world where councils who are useless most of the time are dealing with developers and architects that are all possibly mediocre or worse and so there's a mismatch between the built outcomes of policy and the good intentions of policy so in trying to curate these things, I guess one of the things I was advocating for in my presentation was also the idea to open our eyes to what's actually existent and what's good about certain situations, whether it's the last project that had 
a fairly ugly building, but lots of good individual activities happening. You know, it's crazy to just adopt policy and remove it all and restart again with good ideas about connectivity and all these sorts of things. But the same with materiality, like often there's these, we like these industrial buildings because they look so great and have these forms and things. Obviously they're not human when they're made, they need to be engaged with, but this idea that they often get destroyed or, or compromised so badly that they're unrecognizable for the qualities that we actually liked about them. Um, so I think this is a curatorial, I'd suggest as a curatorial role is, is considering the broader concepts and ideals of what we want and also opening our eyes to the specifics of individual circumstances, how you actually achieve that to make it happen, as I said, on the broader scale and adopted in cities with all the stakeholders that exist. Yeah, great. <laughs> no, I think they're really, um, all really good perspectives. Um, I might sort of give an opportunity if anyone's got a burning question to ask. Um, otherwise, I'm more than happy to keep going. Yeah, go for it. Do you want this? I think so, yes. Now, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I found them, uh, even if very different, uh, but definitely uh, interesting for many different aspects. I will talk with you uh, hours. Uh, now, but I want just, I would like to, to focus on just the issue of uh, temporary uses and temporary architects, architecture, because there are two different things, uh, as we know. And uh, I, um, I found very interesting what you call the interim uh, connectivity improvement, because in the, uh, in the project, uh, I think that the idea to, um, which is not new, of course, but it's important when uh, uh, you are able to, to propose and to do it, um, start uh, uh, to uh, somehow to um, the, the process of place making uh, uh, with uh, temporary, uh, not only ar arrangement of the space, but also uses. So my question that is somehow related to the issue of creating, but in terms of, uh, okay, uh, was uh, how is the stage of that proposal? Is still the pro a proposal, the, the one in front of the station that you mentioned, or uh, there is something going on. And besides the uh, organization of the space the, in a temporary way, uh, I was curious about uh, if there were some proposal in terms of uh, involving people uh, in uh, using the space with a sort of curating uh, or um, somehow agreement of this kind. Then thank you. Thank you for the question. With a particular um, the particularities of the station square. So the the station was funded and came first. So that's permanent. Um, the station square is 20 or 30 years, depending on <laughs> when the financial um, sort of situation works to develop that site. Now, um, there was a railway line with the station and then a big development site on the west hand side. Um, and then the site I was showing you with the station square is on the, the eastern side. So the development site on the western side was the first site to come forwards um, for housing development. And that's currently being built, it's on site. So they desperately needed ways of getting this um, uh, 20,000 new residents over the road or over the railway and over the road and to connect to the rest of it. So um, that's why the council then put the funding for the station square to be built, um, but not as a permanent thing, but as a sort of a, a 20, if we uh, 20, maybe 30 year public space. So, um, and then in terms of curatorial things, yes, that, that sort of site I showed with the, um, where we were trying to provide new education spaces and um, enterprise spaces and workspaces was, I suppose, in a curatorial logic. And it's quite symbolic is to say, okay, this is an urban regeneration that's happening. Here's a new public space. And we had like lighting for stages and, and kind of venues and a bike repair shop and a cafe and things. And then a public square with the workspaces around it that is now currently the designs are out to tender for meanwhile providers and events providers to take that on and build it out. 
And so that's right bang in the center of the, 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 um, the, the sort of ter the regeneration territory. And it's symbolic in the sense of trying to say, this is a new area and you can be here, as well as being something that starts to generate activity in real, uh, and in a more sort of holistic manner, small scale, um, economic activity that can start to proliferate around the area. The bigger challenge is then all those yellow and gray lines we're showing is getting those people over what seems like an impossible terrain <laughs> to the industrial estate and um, that we were that, that is sort of thriving but that, that we're working on on the other side and, and the other way uh, 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 and connections either way.